Well, the ongoing research on the clinical side, of course, involves the phase three clinical trial program. There are multiple BTK inhibitors now in advanced phase three clinical trials in relapsing, but also in progressive forms, both primary progressive MS and non-relapsing secondary progressive MS. So those are sort of the, the particularly exciting contexts of the greatest unmet need. Uh, I would add that we now understand that the biology of progression is not starting only when we see it in secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS, but it's probably there under the surface for much earlier. So if these drugs prove to strike a good balance between efficacy, including relapsing biology, but also the progressive biology, and they end up being sufficiently safe and well tolerated, they will likely be relevant for people across the MS spectrum, from very early MS, potentially first line, all the way through to people with progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. So that's, we, we need to get those results as far as the first next in terms of data. Um, but there are other things that we would like to do. We'd like to show with other assessments that we're impacting with this class of therapies brain compartmentalized inflammation. For instance, looking at microglial activation with PET, uh, positron emission tomography type imaging, which can actually assess at the level of individual cell types the activation state and limiting that in regions of the brain that we think are involved not in the relapsing biology, but in the progressive biology would uh, be further evidence to substantiate the potential of these therapies. We have a few things to learn on the safety side. We've had a signal uh, with respect to potential hepatic injury, uh, infrequent events where there are bumps in liver enzymes. Um, this has happened to several of the BTK inhibitors and, and their trial programs have been at least partially stopped by the FDA in terms of not recruiting further patients for a period of time uh, or uh, avoiding continued treatment in people who've not been on the drug for very long because the observation to date is that if this happens, it tends to happen relatively early with the exposure. So if you've been on it for a while, for several months, maybe it's not going to be an issue. Some people develop this, some people don't. When people have and the drug has been stopped, it's been reversible. So people have not really run into major issues. And there have been cases where it has actually normalized even in the face of continued treatment. So we really need the phase three clinical trial data to understand how big an issue this is and we will almost certainly be able to come up with a risk mitigation strategy, so we'll need to study that, and it may be that monitoring blood for the first period of time on this drug is a requirement as part of its uh, marketing. Of course, everything depends again on uh, pivotal trial data. So those are some of the questions that relate both to the clinical data that we're looking for in the next epoch, uh, as well as some of the biomarker imaging data. There are other biomarker type studies that the field is very interested in in the context of BTK inhibition. Can we use this type of treatment to impact biomarkers finally having a treatment that may impact previously uh, unattainable treatment goals of targeting progressive MS? So while much progress has been made and there's excitement about the prospect of BTK inhibitors uh, potentially targeting progressive MS, not just relapsing disease, there remain major unmet needs in the field. We, we still have more to learn about mechanisms underlying progressive biology. We also recognize that immune cells are there to do good. They go awry in some conditions like MS. We try to correct things, but we may push too far. So we don't want to entirely limit the capacity, for, for example, including of microglial cells, to do what they normally do. And the hope is that the BTK inhibition is not going to prevent their capacity to be activated entirely, because some activation in certain contexts may be good and important. And so one of the nice things about BTK inhibitors is they don't kill the cells that they target, as opposed to depleters that the cells are then gone. Uh, so that may mean that we can do this for longer periods of time without exposing patients to additional risks. Um, but there's also the prospect that it's not simply decreasing activation completely, it's only decreasing activation partially, so maybe taking the edge off things and still allowing some level of important activation. And there's a modulation that may actually be shifting B cells and myeloid cells from more pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. Those are still um, hypothetical constructs in the sense that we have evidence in vitro, some evidence in animal models, but we don't yet know how that aspect of BTK inhibition will play out in patients, and people are different. So the issue with the treatment uh, and the bar that we try to set for something that we consider safe is we'd like something to be safe for everybody. The question is, would we accept, or is there a role for treatment that is highly effective in 99% of the population, 
but potentially risky for a small percent of the population. If we could figure out in advance who that small percentage is, everybody else benefits from a great treatment. And so part of the development and the questions that remain to be answered is understanding the treatment, understanding what we're trying to target by further understanding MS, but also developing these risk mitigation strategies that then will allow us to place a treatment in a way that may benefit many people as opposed to not benefit anybody while sparing others who may either not benefit sufficiently or be at risk. So that's one of the major gaps. And the other one, of course, is we'd love to stop MS completely, but we'd also like to fix things that are broken. So as far as repair, uh, there's uh, much, much to be done.